Welcome to this video on fair lending. In this video, we'll cover redlining discrimination. Referencing the interagency fair lending examination procedures that FDIC consumer compliance examiners use, we will take you through the redlining discrimination risk indicators. We'll also offer some practical tips to consider with addressing redlining discrimination risk in your bank's compliance management system, or CMS. Redlining is when a lender provides unequal access to credit or unequal terms of credit because of the race, color, national origin, or other prohibited characteristics of the residents of the area in which the applicant resides or will reside, or where the property is located. The term reverse redlining is used to describe the practice of targeting certain borrowers or areas with less advantageous products or services on a prohibited basis. But what is a prohibited basis? The prohibited bases are described in the two primary laws covering fair lending, the Equal Credit Opportunity Act, or ECOA, and the Fair Housing Act, or FHA. Both of these laws prohibit discrimination based on race or color, religion, national origin, and sex. ECOA also prohibits discrimination based on marital status, age, an applicant's receipt of income from a public assistance program, and an applicant's good faith exercise of any rights under the Consumer Credit Protection Act. Under ECOA, public assistance means any federal, state, or local governmental assistance program that provides an income supplement that is continuing and periodic. The FHA prohibits discrimination based on familial status and disability, which is referred to in the statute as handicap. It also prohibits retaliation against a person who exercises his or her rights under the FHA or retaliation against a person who helps another person exercise his or her rights under the FHA. A redlining analysis for a bank may be applied to determine whether, on a prohibited basis, a bank does not extend credit in certain geographic areas, or a bank targets certain borrowers or certain geographic areas with less advantageous products. It may determine whether a bank makes loans in such an area, but at a restricted or lower level, or upon less favorable terms or conditions as compared to contrasting areas. Finally, a redlining analysis helps determine whether a bank omits or excludes such an area on a prohibited basis from efforts to market residential loans or solicit customers for residential credit. Let's talk about market area for a minute. The Reasonably Expected Market Area, or REMA, is described in the Interagency Fair Lending Examination Procedures. REMA is the area where the bank actually marketed and provided credit and where it could reasonably be expected to have marketed and provided credit. The REMA may be the same as the bank's Community Reinvestment Act, or CRA, assessment area, or the REMA may be different than the CRA assessment area. After discussions with the bank during the consumer compliance examination, examiners will determine the REMA to evaluate whether the bank is avoiding certain areas. To determine whether areas have been excluded, examiners will look at the bank's activity within the REMA. In other words, the REMA is the area that examiners use to evaluate the bank's lending patterns and its level of service to various geographies. A redlining analysis usually will focus on comparative evidence, as overt evidence of redlining is relatively uncommon. Examiners compare the bank's treatment of areas with contrasting racial, national origin, age, or other prohibited characteristics. The most common redlining analysis is based on race or national origin, where differences in lending and marketing are observed in minority areas, which are areas with a high concentration of residents of a particular race or national origin. The same analysis could be adapted to evaluate relative access to credit for areas of geographical concentration with respect to other prohibited basis groups. Now, let's go into specifics about the redlining discrimination risk indicators discussed in the Interagency Fair Lending Examination Procedures. 
When examiners perform a fair lending review, they assess whether redlining discrimination risks are present within the bank's credit process. There are 12 redlining risk indicators in the interagency procedures listed as R1 through R12, where R stands for redlining. These indicators represent areas that may warrant further review to mitigate fair lending risk. During the consumer compliance examination, examiners evaluate information to assess whether these risks are applicable. We'll discuss each of these indicators in some detail during our presentation. Let's start with our first risk indicator, R1. This indicator references significant differences as revealed in hunger data in the number of applications received, withdrawn, approved, not accepted, and closed for incompleteness, or loans originated in those areas in the institution's market that have relatively high concentrations of minority group residents compared with areas with relatively low concentrations of minority residents. Certain banks are subject to the reporting requirements of the Home Mortgage Disclosure Act, or HMDA. HMDA data provides the bank with a record of whether the bank's activity in any minority area appears to be excluded or otherwise treated less favorably as compared to other areas in the REMA. For example, a lack of or a minimal level of lending within a minority area could indicate that the bank is avoiding doing business in that area. The next risk indicator, R2, relates to significant differences between approval or denial rates for all applicants, whether they are minority or non-minority, in areas with relatively high concentrations of minority group residents compared with areas with relatively low concentrations of minority residents. For example, there could be a risk if the approval rate of all applications from non-minority areas was 80%, while 75% of all applications from minority areas were being denied. In such a case, further review may be warranted. Risk indicator R3 references significant differences between denial rates based on insufficient collateral for applicants from areas with relatively high concentrations of minority residents and those areas with relatively low concentrations of minority residents. For example, examiners may review adverse action notices to see if any provide insufficient collateral as a reason for denial and can then determine where the collateral properties are located. R3 risk could be present if the properties deemed to be insufficient collateral were disproportionately located in minority areas. This could reflect a different standard in how collateral is being evaluated in minority areas as compared to non-minority areas. Next, R4 addresses significant differences in the number of originations of higher price loans or loans with potentially negative consequences for borrowers, i.e. non-traditional mortgages, prepayment penalties, or lack of escrow requirements. The first step here is to understand the products the bank offers and if those include any features with potentially negative consequences or relatively high costs. For products that are offered by the bank, HMDA data or other loan data would be used to plot such loans on a map to assess whether such products are offered more in areas with relatively high concentrations of minority residents as compared to areas with relatively low concentrations of minority residents. R5 states, other patterns of lending identified during the most recent CRA performance evaluation that differ by the concentration of minority residents. The CRA evaluation is often conducted concurrently with the consumer compliance examination and examiners evaluate fair lending risk as part of every compliance examination. So, the examiner performing the fair lending review may be able to obtain information about the bank's activities from the CRA performance evaluation. While CRA focuses on activity by income level, examiners could also assess whether or not any CRA performance issues impact the fair lending review. The next risk indicator, 
R6 relates to explicit demarcation of credit product markets that excludes MSAs, political subdivisions, census tracts, or other geographic areas within the institution's lending market or CRA assessment areas and having relatively high concentrations of minority residents. This risk indicator focuses on whether a bank directly excludes particular areas from access to particular credit products. For example, examiners would note redlining risk if a bank's stated market area is shaped like a donut or horseshoe that excludes areas where the majority of people are minorities. Next, R7 risk involves the difference in services available or hours of operation at branch offices located in areas with concentrations of minority residents when compared to branch offices located in areas with concentrations of non-minority residents. The question here is if the bank offers different services or has different available hours in minority areas as compared to non-minority areas. Another risk indicator, R8, describes policies on receipt and processing of applications, pricing, conditions, or appraisals and valuation, or on any other aspect of providing residential credit that vary between areas with relatively high concentrations of minority residents and those areas with relatively low concentrations of minority residents. For example, a policy would present redlining risk if the bank offered a pricing discount for loans secured with properties located in an area where there are mostly non-minority census tracts as compared to those located where there were concentrations of majority-minority areas. Another example is if a bank had appraisal processes that varied based on the location of the property. For example, the institution may have applied more onerous appraisal standards, such as requiring a full appraisal, for properties located in majority-minority geographies and have more relaxed standards for properties located in non-minority areas. The next risk indicator, R9, relates to situations where the institution's CRA assessment area appears to have been drawn to exclude areas with relatively high concentrations of minority residents. For example, if a bank's CRA assessment area excludes portions of a county that contains majority minority tracts, the question would be why this exclusion occurred or why the bank's CRA assessment area did not include the entire county. This risk factor is similar to R6 discussed earlier in this video except that R6 is not limited to the CRA assessment area. R10 addresses employee statements that reflect an aversion to doing business in areas with relatively high concentrations of minority residents. For example, if an employee makes statements that indicate distaste for making loans in a certain neighborhood or section of town, and these areas have a high concentration of minority residents, there is redlining risk. R11 addresses complaints or other allegations by consumers or community representatives that the institution excludes or restricts access to credit for areas with relatively high concentrations of minority residents. Discrimination issues raised in consumer complaints represent risk and may evidence broader fair lending concerns with the bank's lending activities especially when a trend is identified. The final risk indicator discussed in the interagency procedures is R12, which arises where an institution has most of its branches in predominantly non-minority neighborhoods at the same time that the institution's subprime mortgage subsidiary has branches which are located primarily in predominantly minority neighborhoods. Subprime products generally have higher costs than prime products. If the branches located in majority-minority areas tend to be branches of a subsidiary that offer subprime products rather than bank branches that offer prime products, there is a concern that residents of majority-minority areas are not being given equal access to less costly loan products. 
Now that we've gone through the redlining risk indicators and several examples, we want to note that specific findings of illegal credit discrimination by redlining would depend on the facts and circumstances of the situation at hand. Now, let's talk about how a bank's compliance management system, or CMS, could help address fair lending risk. First of all, one way to mitigate redlining risk is to conduct a redlining risk assessment, self-identify the risk, and take any corrective measures that sufficiently address the risk. For example, if a redlining risk assessment showed that a bank received significantly fewer mortgage applications than peer lenders in the same market, the bank could reassess its marketing and outreach strategy. Actively considering redlining risk when developing or revising policies and procedures can help a bank to identify practices that might increase redlining risk. Important considerations may include policies and procedures about how the bank establishes or adjusts its market area, which products it offers where, and the manner in which it advertises its products. Ongoing training is also a key element to an effective CMS. Training that discusses redlining, how it can occur, and methods to prevent excluding majority-minority areas provides useful information to bank personnel that may help them to identify and think of ways to mitigate specific redlining risk they might not have considered. There are several ways redlining risks could evolve over time. Policies, procedures, and training may change over time as the bank adds new products and services. The bank could expand into new markets. Alternatively, the demographic composition of geographies within the bank's market could change over time. Changes can also happen when a bank's lending program involves an affiliate, subsidiary, or third party who enters into a relationship with mortgage brokers, real estate agents, or lead generation providers. Before entering into these relationships, it is important to be aware of and understand the details of the arrangements and to clearly establish what steps each party will take to evaluate and mitigate redlining risk. A bank also may be able to leverage monitoring and or audits conducted to assess discrimination risks relating to the institution's underwriting and pricing patterns to consider redlining risk as well. However, how monitoring or audits are structured affects how useful they will be in identifying redlining risk. For example, if a bank limits its monitoring or audit to a limited set of products, that monitoring or audit likely would not effectively mitigate redlining risk related to other products. An effective CMS would also include processes to identify consumer complaints relating to redlining. Reviewing and investigating such complaints could provide bank personnel and management with helpful insight into how the local community perceives the bank's lending. As we conclude, we'd like to remind you that the FDIC has technical assistance videos on a number of other topics, including other videos on fair lending that can be found on the Banker Resource Center at www.fdic.gov. There are many resources available on the FDIC website, including the Consumer Compliance Examination Manual and the Interagency Fair Lending Examination Procedures. If you need additional information or have questions or comments, please contact your bank's Consumer Compliance Review Examiner or email the FDIC at supervision at fdic.gov. Thank you for viewing this video. We hope you found it both useful and informative.